Lord. You may be seated. Good morning, good morning, good morning. This is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I hope that you're saying the same thing this morning. Amen. What a good day this is. Praise the Lord. The weather's great. God is great. You're not too bad either. Praise the Lord. <laughs> but I'm glad you're here. We're in a message, a series of messages. This is the fourth in that series entitled Against All Odds. Now, this is a series that has been dealing with the fact that in this world and in this life, we deal with situations. Sometimes those situations look impossible. There's just no way in, around, over, through, underneath, whatever the case may be. Jesus made it very clear that just because we're children of God doesn't, doesn't mean that you're going to escape difficulty in the world. One of those great simple Bible stories from children's church that we learned was about Jesus telling the story of the two builders. One built his house upon the sand, one built his house upon the rock. And you know the story that the winds came and the rains came and then the floods came up and the house on the sand was destroyed and the house on the rock stood firm. And I said, the one who builds his house upon the rock is the one who hears my words and does them. In other words, people who build their life upon the truth are people who have a solid foundation for their life. But catch something else in this storyline here. There are still winds, rain, floods, no matter what your foundation is, there's still going to be issues, there's still going to be problems, there's still going to be things you have to deal with in your life, no matter what's going on. Amen. So mark it down. It's going to rain. The skies are going to turn dark. The rain's going to come down. The winds are going to rip at your life at times, and the floods are going to come up, and you might think you're going to drown. But be of good cheer, <laughs> Jesus said. I have overcome all these issues and all these things. As we've gone through this series, we looked at the Word of God and looked at the different scenarios that we, we come into in our life and we, we have to deal with in our life where it does seem that we are against all odds. And we've had several different kinds of scenarios as we looked at them. The first week we talked about a, a man who, who basically became a judge over the Philistines and destroyed 600 Philistines with a farm implement. His name was Shamgar. When the rest of the nation is sitting around hiding in fear and doubt and worry and frustration and wringing their hands, how are we going to get by? This one man by the name of Shamgar stands up and makes a difference. And basically he just starts from where he is with what's in his hand and accomplishes the will of God. Sometimes that's the way it is. You just got to start where you are with what you've got and believe God and trust God. And you'll see that although the odds may seem completely against you in all the ways that you could lose, you'll see the grace of God. Then we went into the second week talking about David. And remember, he's going to that time of deep discouragement in his life. And all of us come to those times where we have to deal with that kind of despair of the soul. You know, it, nothing seems to be working out. Everything seems to be against you. When you had very clearly heard from God about his promises, about his will, you embrace those things in your heart. But the more that you pursued God, it just things keep going, falling apart. They kept coming against you. David was this way to the point he runs into the land of the Philistines, his enemies, begins to strike up relationships there and continues to have heartache, failure, discouragement. And some other enemy comes up and raids his camp while he's gone. When his 600 men and he return to the camp, remember, everything's gone. Only the smell of smoke remains. His wife and children have been carried off. All their treasures and goods, uh, what they still had left in the world, it was gone. And even now at this point of his, in his deep despair, in the lowly bowels of his discouragement, what happens? God speaks. Now, what's happening while God's speaking, his men are also speaking. They're talking about killing him. You know, you ever been in that place where even your best friends want to shoot you? That's not a fun place to be, is it? Well, that's where he is, but he seeks God's face and God gives him a word and he, he overcomes. And not too long after that, he's, re, he's instated as the king over the whole nation of Israel. Last week, we talked about Elijah at Dothan. and we talked about how they were surrounded by the, the king of Aram. And the servant of Elisha said, there's no hope. There's no way that we're going to overcome. There's no way we're going to win this war. It's just you and me at what's going to happen. And he said, we're going to perish. We're going to die. There's no hope. And that's sometimes we get to those places. We're surrounded. There's just no way we're going to get out of this deal. 
But God shows up, he opens the eyes of the servant, he blinds the, the army of, of the king of Aram, and they walk out of this whole thing in victory. Tonight, we're gonna, this morning, we're going to look at a passage that's probably very familiar to each one of us. In fact, probably in the last 25 years here in the church, I've preached on I know at least twice. In revivals and crusades, I've preached on this a lot. It has to do with faith in the furnace, faith in the fire, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I want to approach it a little different this morning in, in, in reference, obviously, to the against all odds. Because these guys are in a situation where they're against all odds. But remember this, as you look in Daniel here in a moment, and we look at this passage about King Nebuchadnezzar, who builds this big image to himself. Remember that that passage of scripture, it really there's three tenses to it. You say, so what do you mean? It's a past event. It did happen in, in time and in history. Archaeologists have proven this. You know, these people existed in time and eternity. This was a real event in time. And there was really something that God was doing there in that moment, in the past, relevant to these people. God was working a work of revival. But remember, Nebuchadnezzar builds this image that he wants everybody to worship it as a result of a dream he's had. Now, if you look in the Old Testament at the book of Daniel, it's kind of the, the equivalent to the book of Revelation in the New Testament, where you have all this prophecy laid out. So not only was this a past event, it's also a prophetic event about what would happen in the future. The image was, a, was an image made that started with a head of gold and it went to silver shoulders and then torsos down to, to bronze until it got to each element of the statue in which it was made was a weaker element. The last thing was uh, the feet of clay and iron, the ten toes. And, and the prophetic significance of the image was that God had given this dream and interpreted it by Daniel was that how the kingdoms of the nations would, would, would fare out and kind of follow through in, in the course of history and time. That God tells Nebuchadnezzar, you're the greatest kingdom ever. This Babylonian empire is the great, there'll never be another like it. You're the, you're the height of what men can do, basically. And he said, but every nation in the context of the way this was made up will be a lesser nation until the last Nations of significance, at least in prophecy, were represented by the feet, the clay and iron and the toes. And uh, if you follow the prophetic portion of this, you see how that all plays out back to the last influencing nations, decision making nations for the globe would be a confederation of nations made of 10 nations. All right. Which many people, and I don't have a problem believing, point to the, the European Union as being that. So there's that prophetic element, but we're not talking about that today. But then there's a historical element, you know, that you see here uh, that, that happened in what, what, what took place. There's also a present lesson we can learn from it. And I think presently where we are prophetically, where we are in the times, in the end of times, and what we're seeing happen in the world today, the, the restoration of the nation of Israel, the, United, uh, the union of confederation of nations with the EU, uh, and what's happening in that part of the world, all the things that are surrounding us, the, uh, the back to the rise and power of the Russian bear, back to the influence of Muslim nations that surround uh, the nation of Israel, all those are prophetic. And so you, you see that, but in the context of that, that's, I believe, we're right in the formation of, the, of what this dream was talking about, all right? We're, we're seeing these things come to pass. We're, we're seeing fulfillment of prophecy before our eyes every day. So uh, as we look at this, this lesson today and we look at what we're talking about against all odds, it, I think there's an important lesson here for our church and for every Christian that we, we, we understand the times, like the men of Issachar who understood the season, the times that we're in, that we understand when we say for such a time as this, we know what that time is. These times that surround us. But we'll see if we believe the Bible that for the believer, things are just gonna get more difficult in the context of expressing your Christianity and living out fully and publicly, publicly in the social world around you, living out fully your Christian life. We're already seeing a lot of persecution around the world. We're seeing what ISIS is doing. We're seeing what the communists have done for centuries in killing Christians, imprisoning believers. And there's a term we throw loosely around in our country called freedom of religion, freedom to express our religion. That's only, you know, a, a, a reality in a couple of nations, you know, in the world. America being one, and we have it because the biblical principles upon which we were founded. But understand, as we see the prophetic clock tick, tock, tick, tock, tick, ticking its way down, 
then we see also the influence of the world and of Satan and upon uh, his forces in the end of times and making it more difficult for believers to express their religious freedoms, so to say. Now, we believe it goes well beyond religion into our very life. We, we live for Christ. It's who, who, who we serve. It, it's who our life is. But understand, Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego give us a clear prophetic picture of the day that we're living in and how important it is for you and I, if we're really going to be what God's called us to be, to let it be known who we serve and who we live for. You can't live in the shadows in these days. You can't live kind of hidden out in the church in these days. If you're going to make a difference in the world, you're going to have to be a Christian who says, hey, I realize that if I'm going to serve God, I need to get serious about it. This message, I've broken it down to Four simple points, or maybe a couple of sub points under that. But at first point, let me go back to go back to the slide before this, and somehow it jumped up on me. It should say that the out, dealing with the outline. There's four points here. One is that the conflict that we are in. That's the first point I want to deal with. The second point I want to talk about the convictions we hold, because Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego held to their to what they believed. The third point is the consequences that we face, and then the the conqueror that we serve. Because it will look like at times, and I said in our leadership dinner the other night, these are some discouraging days, all right? When you look around and you see what's going on in the world, these are some, some hard times and troublesome times. And for a believer, they can be extremely discouraging if you look at it with your physical eyes. But we're looking at things that aren't seen. We're looking at what the Bible says about these days. So, so let's look and realize that, first of all, we know that we, we have a conflict, all right? And as we deal with the conflict issue, this is the way this, this starts out. And, and it breaks down to three things, the world, the flesh, and the devil in, in the co course of our, our conflict, all right? The conflict is this, and, and we've talked about it so much, I'll just barely deal with it. One is, we know that if you're going to live for Jesus, you're going to sense an opposing force in the world that we live in. And we know the Bible says God so loved the world. But I'm talking about in the context, that's humanity. But I'm talking about when the Bible also refers to the world in the context of people who reject God. We're living in a world that for the most part has rejected God. We're living in a country that for the most part has rejected God. We don't want God in school. We don't want God in our courts. We don't want God in our, our workplaces. We don't want God at the football game. We just don't, you know, let's, let's exclude God. Keep, you, you believers, keep your, your, keep your mouth shut. You know, let's, let's separation of church and state, you know, the, the complete fallacy of what that po political philosophy is all about. You know, it, 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 we, you sense that. More and more and more you're going to sense that. Then there's another conflict we deal with in our flesh. By the way, it's, it's an ally to the world if you're not careful. It's an ally to Satan if you're not careful. Because there is that fallen nature. That who we were before we met Christ. That, that resonant residue of sin that's in our life. The old nature we call it, alright? We have to deal with the old nature. Now we deal with it as scripture tells us, as believers, we die daily to the old man. We start our mornings by saying, I, I live for Christ today. We make our statement of faith and we ask God to fill us with his spirit. We choose that we're going to serve the Lord that day. And we put off the old man, like the scripture says. But then there's that third element. Uh, Bill Stafford called it this way. We have our external foe, the world. We have our internal foe, our flesh. And then we have our, ex, our infernal foe, the devil. And we, he's real. And he's constantly targeting your life. Let me say it as simple as I can. The devil hates you. Let me say it again. The devil hates you. And not only does he hate you, he really hates you. You know, he hates you with a perfect hatred. He hates, every time he looks at you, no matter if you're lost, saved, or backslidden, all he can think about is the created work of God, so he hates it. He hates man. He hates you. He, you know, he hates your wife. He hates your husband. He hates your children. He hates your grandkids. He hates you. You need to get that down. He has nothing to offer you. He has nothing to give you. He's not going to help you. He has one mind for you that's to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Now, that's the conflict. When you look where Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego come, you see this conflict very clearly played out. And it starts like this appeal from the world at first with this dedication. It says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold. This is a result of the dream. The height of which was 60 cubits and width six cubits. I mean, it's just marked with prophecy 666, all right. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the province to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. 
All right, and so here they come. They've been called the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers. You know, let me put it through. Everybody who's anybody comes to stand before the, the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before it, the one that he had set up. I mean, you, you can see the call, it's an invitation. You've got to be there. Especially, you know, if you're a mover or a shaker, you're going to be there. You can almost hear the talk and the chatter before it happens. Uh, you know, the media is blasting out. Uh, hey, the, the, it's, it's, it's image day, you know, Nebuchadnezzar day. The image has been set up. Everybody's going to be there. You can see the commercials. This so-and-so, rock star, superstar, sports uh, uh, star, you know, on that political genius. Everybody who's anybody is going to be there. <clears throat> you, can, you can hear the chatter, can't you? Are you going? Well, yeah, I'm going. Everybody's going to be there. Uh, I got an invitation. You, you get an invitation. I didn't get an invitation. How come I didn't get an invitation? I want an invitation. Where can I get an invitation? I want to go. And, you know, because, because that's where everybody's going to be. So he calls all the, all the people of influence together. And you can see them there in your mind. Just, here's this massive image. And they're all standing there looking at it. Like sheep being led to the slaughter. They come because why? Everybody else is doing it. It is the thing. It, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's that call, it's, it's that appeal from the world that says, come and, and be like us and come and, and shape your life like us. It's that what Romans 12 talks about when it says, don't be conformed to the world. Well, this is what's happening. And the world loves it when we all get together and we're all just alike. And we, you know, we all got our iPad and our iPhone and our iSelf or whatever I might be in there. We're just, you know, got to have it, got to get it. Everybody else, you know, we just got to get in on it. Now, that's, that's the, 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 the call that goes up and it's, it's an appeal to, to our flesh. Then, then with that, you know, comes this, what we, we call the decree. The decree is the, the appeal to our flesh, you know, that, that, that the world is calling now and now we sense that call. The world is pressing us to be there. The world is telling us what to do. And now we have this response. And, 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 and the decree is this, everybody should fall down and worship. This is what happens. A, a, a herald, and that's the same word we use for preacher, by the way, the world's preacher, uh, loudly proclaims to you, the command is given. Oh, people, nations, men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the chon, psaltery, bagpipe, all kinds of music. When the band strikes it up, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. But whosoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. By the way, this is a demand. But this is the way the world operates. You must. You must. Why? Because the Supreme Court said you must. It's the law of the land. You must. Well, what if I don't? Then you're in trouble. Then you're a bigot. Then you're a racist. Then you're a hater. And haters going to hate, hate, hate. <laughs> right? That's just so, if that's who you are, then you're excluded. You cannot be different from us. You cannot stand, you can't act differently. You can't dress, you cannot be different from us. And you know, about in the 1970s, late 70s, the church swallowed that line. And they said, we've got to be just like them. And here's the way it goes. Because we have to appeal to the seekers. We have to have a seeker mindset and a seeker sensitive church because the seekers, Folks, nobody's seeking. Nobody's seeking. The Bible said there are none that seek after God. It's God that's seeking. It's the church that's seeking. God says, you go out, make disciples of all nations. He said, you go out into the highways and the byways. Jesus came. He's the seeker. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. I wasn't looking for God. All right. You weren't looking for God until God came to you, until conviction started. Salvation begins with the Holy Spirit convicting your heart. You'll never wake up. You'll never smell the roses till your nose gets opened by the Holy Ghost. Are you with me? Say, uh-huh. So don't, don't buy into that. The world's not looking. They just want you to be like they are and let you do everything they do and to manufacture a service and a church and a worship center that's just like they are. And man, if we have to have Easter egg hunts, we'll do it. Uh -huh. Even though we don't believe in idolatry, 
And the Easter eggs and bunnies are all about the goddess of fertility and Ishtar. But we're going to do it, bless God, because we've got to reach the children. With eggs? And Santa Clauses? You know, Xbox, whatever it might be. All these things have given way to prayer. All these things have given way to seeking God. All these things have given way to preaching the gospel. All these things have given way to sacrificial commitment, sacrificial love, and soul winning. We don't want to have to do that. We just want to have something that's attaining, entertaining, and attractive and brings people in. This is, the, this, this is what the world is, is dictating. This is the decree that has been given to us, and we swallow the line or we don't. Here's the dictate, because it goes beyond just a demand. And it, there's a dictate, and, and this is where Satan comes in. This is where he's exposed. Daniel 3, Nebuchadnezzar responded to them. Now, I don't know like, all the story. It doesn't explain details here. But obviously, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when the top 40 strikes up, they don't go down. You know, they didn't turn their cell phones on. And... <laughs> right? They didn't do it. They didn't bow down. And what happens? The Chaldeans make sure. There's always somebody that's going to make sure. There's somebody's job to ruin your life. Isn't there always somebody like that that seems to be around? There's, just, there's, a, there's a committee sometimes. So they're going to they're gonna find you out that you didn't conform and you're not being like everybody else, you know, and they're going to report it to somebody. So King Nebuchadnezzar hears the word. And listen how sweet he is. He's such a nice guy. And this is the way, it, but watch how quick it changes, you know. And he said to them, is it true? Shad, me, hey, hey Ben. It's not true, is it, man? You, you don't serve my gods. You don't worship my golden image that I've set up? Come on, guys. I'm your bud. We're brothers, man. I, I, have, I have blessed, I've given you position and authority in the country. He says, well, here's what I'm going to do. Verse 15. If you're ready, see how nice that is? Are you ready? If you're ready. Uh, at the moment, you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, Lear, trijon, psaltery, bagpipe, all kinds of music to fall down and worship image I've made very well. But here's where it changes. But if you don't worship, there it is. You will immediately be cast in the midst of a furnace, a blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Furnace, a blazing fire. Who's the God that can deliver you? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reply. Now, here's the, here's, the, here's the deal. And this is the way it works because whether you like it or not, in this whole issue of your life, there's personalities involved. It's God and it's the devil. You're going to serve one or the other. You're not going to serve both. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. If you're not gathering, if we're not being the seekers, then we're scattering. So he makes it real clear. There's a real clear line of delineation. I mean, this is not one of those Obama lines that disappears in the sand. All right. This is a line that's really clear right on the button. You know, hey, you do this. This is going to happen. And he, he follows through with it. You know, this, this is the problem. Here's the dictate. You do it or you die. And if you don't, then you die. Satan is always going to come back and be real sweet to you. Kind of reason with you. Try to use your warped mind and thinking and processes. Say you really don't want to die. And all your friends are out here and everybody's doing it. All those things come up. But the response is based both on their convictions Remember in chapter one of Daniel, this is chapter three, in chapters one and two, you see Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego, they're all standing by their convictions, even about what they eat. You know, they wouldn't eat things that didn't follow the kosher law, which they had been given as children of God. And in their, with their wisdom and their intelligence, they, they're being threatened even at that point. They say, well, let's just have a test. Let's see, which is, let's see what works and what doesn't work. And so here, here, here's the test that comes. Now listen very carefully. I want everybody to find a seat if you can. This is, this is so important. And I'm just going to ask you folks, this will be the most important thing I preach the rest of this year. All right? This is, this is vital because you're getting ready to face some things within the next year or two years that if you miss what we're talking about today, you're going to fail miserably as a believer. This is so important. And I tried to share the importance of it this morning. You know, there's sometimes when we, we preach, we're preaching from our heart, but this is something that just gets down to, to, I believe, the passion of the conviction of scriptures for saints in the end times. And we better realize it, that are us. 
Amen. This is so important. What will you do when, the, when it comes down to being threatened, when it comes down to being put in, 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 on the spot, when it comes down to being laughed at, when you're put on focus so that people can see you in the light of, 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 of either rejecting and looking like a fool in them, being intimidated, being laughed at, being ridiculed. This is coming. And in many places, even in our own nation, it is already here. We know we're kind of living in comfort zone over here for a little while. We know over the last 500 to 1,000, 2,000 years, Christians have been losing their lives every day for Jesus Christ. They paid the price. Your brothers and sisters in Christ, people who love the same God you love, who care about the same Jesus you care about, who worship the same God and are dwelt by the same Holy Spirit, part of the same body of Christ that you're part of, are losing their lives. They're watching their children slaughtered in front of them. Today that happens. But do not think that just because we put in God we trust on our coins and upon our paper money that that's going to somehow prohibit us from having to face the same issues. The days are changing rapidly. In fact, not just kind of changing rapidly, it's exponentially, radically changing. Listen to what's, what's, what's said here. You're going to do this or you're going to die, but watch with the response. And this is where we win. This is how we overcome against all odds. Let me put it this way. It's a hundred to one, you're gonna be thrown in the fire. Right? But it's not a hundred to one, you're gonna die in the fire. But it's 100 to 1, you will be delivered in the fire. Now catch what happens. They have to brace now their convictions, which you see them living by. It says Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of the blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. But you have to realize everybody else is, we're not going to. You could lose your job, we're not going to. You could lose your girlfriend, we're not going to. You could lose your status, you're take it away, I'm not gonna bow. I'm not gonna worship the image. I'm not gonna worship your gods. I am not. Read my lips. Amen. No! Amen. I hold to standards. <laughs> now this is, this, this is the part, don't clap yet. <laughs> Where we need to get honest. You say, what do you mean? If you can't have simple standards and convictions in your life about the word of God, about witnessing, about praying, about being in church. If you have no convictions about those things, you will not stand. And you will hit your face, you will bow to the world, you'll do what everybody else does. I mean, how do you think that you're gonna be a mountain climber when you can't even walk over the little berm coming to church? Amen? It's not gonna happen. You know, I'll just give all. You won't give a dime on Sunday morning. What makes you think you're really going to give it all when it comes down to it? Well, you all gave a dollar. We've got to get real about ourselves. It's so easy to live in the realm of religious self-deception, isn't it? To just kind of deceive yourself and to say, well, I'm okay. I'm all right. I love God. God loves me. And what happens? We just mess it up completely, don't we? And we don't even realize it. We just, we've patted ourselves on the back. We've neutralized ourselves to, to the point we think we're really spiritual when we're not doing anything for God. We're not serving God. We're not winning anybody to Jesus. We're not praying for anybody. Now you can clap. <laughs> There's no deliberation here, is there? There's no double-mindedness here. There's nobody. They're not taking time out. Hold on, Neb. There's three of us. We gotta talk sober. Go have your little meeting. Okay, be right back. Okay, Shadrach, you know uh, Abednego says. We need to think about this. You know, God's called us to, to be light in the world and to shine and to make a difference in, in Babylon. And you know, if we're dead, we can't do that. 
I know. Listen to him, Shadrach. Listen to Meshach. says, you know, you know if, if we don't bow, you know, I, I could lose my job. You know, I, I really could. If I don't lose my job, I'm certainly not going to get a bonus this year. That ain't going to happen. You know, you know, I got this girl. You know, she's ready to bow down. I, she's putting pressure on me. Bow down, bow down. I, what am I going to do? I think it could cost me my relationship. You know, I was on target. I was on target, man. You're messing things up here. I was on target to be put in the, in, in the school annuals most popular, <laughs> most likely to succeed. I was, on, I was on the road there. I was going to be the prom queen, king, whatever. <laughs> yeah, you know which generation we're dealing with now, right? <laughs> There's no deliberation like that. There's no compromise like that. It's just, no. Uh, no. And, and which brings us, you know, that's, that's the conviction. How are you going to stand in the end times? How are you going to be what God calls you to be? You be now. You stand now. You count the cost now. You give now. You love now. You care now. You're there now. You do what you know you're supposed to be. You don't say tomorrow I'm going to be a better Christian. Next year I'm going to be more faithful. Next year I'm going to be more committed. I got this other stuff right now. That's not going to fly. It doesn't work that way. It's the old thing about, you know, you won't be faithful in the mountains, you're not faithful in the molehills kind of attitude. It's these little things in our life that prepare us for the fire. And the consequences are, are pretty clear. When you look at, at what he says here, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, he doesn't say, oh, that's okay, you guys love Jesus, and you know we believe in religious freedom, so go ahead and do your thing. No. His response, he's not neutral. He said he's filled with wrath, it says. He's, his, he's so mad, his facial expressions are altered towards Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego. You know, you ever seen your mama get that mad? You know, your daddy get that mad? Yeah, you know the face, right? Nebuchadnezzar's putting the face on him. Are oh, you out of your minds? What's the matter with you guys? And you can, I'm seeing what's running through his mind. He said, you know, if you, if you, if you go back to chapter four of this, they've just been exalted in these areas of leadership. I, lift, I put you there and now you're going to do this to me? You're trying to make me look like a fool in front of everybody? You guys are going to pay the price. In fact, here's what we're going to do. I'm giving the order to heat the furnace seven times hotter than it normally is. Seven times. And then he calls in verse 20, he calls his special forces in. He commanded certain valiant warmers. I mean, these are select guys who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them in the fire, the blazing fire furnace. You see these guys? It says they come out and they tie them up and they're clothes and, 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 and you know, the big guys. Athletic, strong, the best of the best, the elite of the army. I don't know, we thought these guys were going to beat them up or something. So he had to get the best soldiers. He's taking all precautions. Hey, the devil, you know, often underestimates God, but he at least tries to put on a good show sometimes. <laughs> and here they are in, in this situation. He says, heat it up even hotter. Folks, it is going to get hotter before it gets better. In this country, you know, outside a real supernatural awakening of God, it's going to get worse. You're going to see things that happen in front of you, things that you would never believe. There are things happening in our nation right now. And whether you agree with them or not, they're still happening, all right? This situation in Virginia with this county clerk, this elected official coming into a place of office. You know, I've heard the media as well as the conservative, the liberal media, they all have their opinions. And I can't believe the ignorance of our culture. Yes. You know, if I'm in an office as an elected official and they tell me to do something like what Martin Luther called unjust laws, you know, in other words, they aren't founded on God's law. They aren't founded on justice and they weren't passed legally. Just some, some Supreme Court justices said, this is the way it's going to be now. And it's going to be that way because we say it's that way. Forget democracy. And they pass this law and I'm an elected official and they come in and say, you have to do this. My answer is, no, I don't. Yeah. You say, well, you just ought to quit. No, I don't. I have an elected official. You unquit me. You can fire me all you want, but I don't. And I don't quit. Why? That has the, that's the opportunity, the privilege of elected office. All right? I don't quit. I don't give up. I'm going to stand my grounds. Yes, they've been called bigots. Yes, they're called foolish. Yes, they're called ignorant. Yes, they're called backward. Everything in the book. The truth of the matter is, hey, I'm here to stay until Jesus takes me home, and you've got to deal with me. Now, you have laws, just laws, to get rid of me. You can do that. Do it. But I'm here. 
I'm here. And here's the thing about it. The laws of our land are slowly being reinterpreted and retranslated to fit the whole scenario of the end time so that the stage is clearly being set for an antichrist who can come in and deliver any kind of message he wants and people believe it and follow it wholeheartedly. Now, this leads us to our victory. And we'll close with this. This is our conquering savior who steps in on the scene and he comes in and this is who we serve. It says, Nebuchadnezzar the king was astounded. What happens? They throw the three guys in and you see them and one time it says they're bound and falling. But then these next verses are different. He said, I see four men loose and walking in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like the son of God's. And Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door. All right. And of the furnace of the blazing fire, and he responds, he speaks to them, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, you servants of the Most High God. Come here. And they came out. Now, I don't know, I don't like fire, being in the midst of fire in my life, do you? And I don't know why Shadrach, I guess I do. The fourth one in there's Jesus, all right? But I know if, you know, if I'm in the fire, first thing, you, you don't have to call me, come out, I'm on my way out. <laughs> Get that thing behind me. I'm out of there. But there, this, this is where, where we, need to, we need to get a grip on the whole end time scenario and the whole against all odds, odds mindset and the whole of no matter what you're going through in your life. The presence of the conqueror, the presence of the king, the presence of Jesus, that no matter what you go through, whether it's the valley of the shadow of death, I am with you. Whether it's the call to go out and preach the gospel to all nations, I am with you. Whether it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, I am with you. Whether it's Daniel in the lion's den, I am with you. Whether it's Noah and the world's being flooded, I am with you. Whether it's you going through whatever you're going through, dealing with whatever you're dealing with, I am with you. That's the glory of it. That's the beauty of it. And that's the power of the presence of Jesus Christ. Nebuchadnezzar's freaked out. Listen, listen to what he said. Basically, he says these several, two things to him. He says, you know, Nebuchadnezzar responds to it, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. First thing, he's praising the Lord. Who sent his angel and delivered his servants and put their trust in him, violating the king's command and yielded up their bodies so, no, so as not to serve or worship any God except their own God. Two things he says there, and I've highlighted them on the screen. He says they, you know, they, tr they put their, their trust in the Lord and they yielded their bodies to the Lord. What do we do today? We put our trust in the Lord and let's yield our bodies to the Lord. My body's not for the world. My body's not for the devil. My body's not for myself. The Bible says the body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. The Bible says present your body a living sacrifice. Don't conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what we do with our bodies. My body belongs to Jesus. What I do with it, where I take it, how I, how I dress it, how I present it, how, how it speaks and where, what it says, all that's for the glory of God. And all of our lives are that way. Yes, we go about the daily affairs of raising kids, preparing meals and going to work and coming home to work. But in all these tasks, Jesus is present and we're letting him live his life through us. And especially when we have to go through these difficult times of crisis and being put on the spot and being called to give an account for ourselves. And we need to do it clearly and verbally and vocally without shame. I'm a believer. I trust Jesus. My life belongs to him. My heart belongs to Christ. I don't live for this world. I live for Jesus. I don't live for me anymore. I live for Jesus. I don't care what's popular. I don't care what's acceptable. I'm going to care what Jesus desires for my heart and for my life. We can be great for the kingdom of God in these last days. We can make a difference in the world in these last days. We can be the church of the end times. If we'll get serious about our commitments, our walk, our time, our finances, and our life with the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. I shared with our leadership meeting the other night that I have, I have suffered through a lot of personal discouragement over the last year. In so many different arenas, in so many different ways. But then coming back to this place and coming back to the scripture and saying, hey, it's gonna rain. It rains on everybody. It's gonna blow hard winds. They blow on everybody. There's gonna be times when it looks you're against all odds, but I am with you. I am for you. So I want you to know just by the simple virtue that you belong to Jesus Christ, you can stand. You can be bold. You can have what it takes. You can shake off the dead religion 
of yesterday. You can shake off just the, the process of going through religious activities because that's what you do. And get back to the serious passion of saying, you know, I want to see God do something with my life. I want to see God make a difference with my life. I want to see God use my church for His glory. I want to see God touch my family and touch my kids and just raise me up to be that woman or man of God that God's called you to be. That's what I want for my life. And that when I do get out in the world and I am sent out to the world, they see something so uniquely different about my life. There's character, there's integrity, there's honesty, there's transparency, that it makes a difference. And I want you to know, as much as the devil's going to have reign and control in the end of times, it's only because God's letting him. But if you study the scriptures, that even during the tribulations, hundreds of thousands of people are getting saved. Amen. During that time, of the worst that the worst the devil can do, people are still coming to Christ at the cost of losing their lives. Maybe it's time to sound the call, come and die so you can live. Come lay everything down so you can experience real life. And in doing that, guess what? you experience real life. Would you stand with your heads bowed?